Hi, I'm Liz Namofsky, host of Finances Personal. Do you ever wonder what you can do to change your behavior for the better when faced with making financial decisions? The good news is we can turn to the field of behavioral economics to provide us useful insights about how people behave in a given context. But how do these insights use the science and knowledge of human behavior to decide how to solve problems in order to get the best results? Now, when it comes to women in finance, behavioral economics provides insights for designing better financial literacy products and programs that can help manage money and debt wisely to plan and save for the future. Joining me today to help us understand the world inside of behavioral economics is Milenia Vinsky. Milenia has her master's of science and PhD in cognitive neuropsychology and is a behavioral economics lead at PricewaterhouseCoopers Canada. Thank you so much for coming in today. Thanks for having me. I was so fascinated when I heard you speak a few months ago. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, this is so helpful and so wonderful in helping women understand themselves. I mean, as women, we make uh, reservations for restaurants. We will make a hair appointment, a beautification appointment. We always make appointments for things that we think are important to us, but we don't do it when it comes to our finances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. What a paradox. <laughs> <laughs> so... I know that you've got primary tools uh, regarding behavioral change. Mm -hmm. So let's go through them all. I think sure. there's four of them. The first one is laws. Yeah, and, and you can think of, there's four of them, and three of them are traditional. These traditional ones are um, ones that are made by government bodies and typically taken on by institutions that deal with customers. And so the first one is laws. It's things are legal or things are not. And the idea is that things that are not illegal, people will not do. The second is the idea of incentives. So this is penalties through um, fees, or you know we talk a lot about late fees or overage fees for different types of accounts, or subsidies or rewards if you do something really well. Right. Um, and then the third one is education. So we talk about that as you know broader financial literacy, or maybe even a step further around marketing and generating awareness. And those are the traditional tools that we use to try and change behavior in society. But what's been really interesting about the shift in probably the last 10 years is that we're taking what we know about human psychology, human decision making, and that is now our tool that we can use to understand behavior, but also change it as well. So how has it changed in the past 10 or 15 years? I think, honestly, the biggest thing is that academics are starting to come out of their <laughs> ivory tower. <laughs> um, we know in business schools, obviously, academics have always been good at translating sort of the theory into the, the practicality and the reality. Um, now psychology and neuroscience and cognitive science are doing the same, and I think we're all better for it. So behavioral science helps us interpret data. Mm -hmm. How do we do that? Yeah, data science and behavioral science are sort of two sides of the same coin. Um, behavioral scientists helps us actually interpret the data. So the data will tell us one variable is correlated with another, or a set of variables will predict an outcome. Okay. Right? If it's a sunny day, we will eat ice cream. <laughs> that is one variable predicting another. The psychology or the behavioral science side of that is it helps us understand why that might be. So why are correlations existing? Why do certain variables lead to different outcomes? And that's a lens that helps us under understand the problem a little bit better. Um, on the other side, data science actually helps us very, be very targeted in our, in our solutions for change. So rather than trying to just guesstimate or do very broad-based solutions to try and change the way that people are behaving, we can be very targeted. And that helps us make sure that we are helping the, the customers or the segments of the population that really need it, who might be very vulnerable, mm -hmm. uh, in a way that maybe we would have not really thought about that in the past, and it can have unintended consequences. So, yeah. So I know that we rely on mental shortcuts to help us navigate through life. Mm -hmm. And right now, a lot of people are having problems with focusing. Uh, everybody wants everything so quickly right now. <laughs> Nobody wants to work hard for anything anymore. They want it now, now, now. So. How does that change now with the whole behavioral economics? Yeah, I, I don't think that we need it now will change because <laughs> we've needed things now for forever. That's true. <laughs> for forever. And that doesn't make us bad people. I think the education and awareness level is so much higher now that we tend to have some guilt around the fact that we do want things right now and it's very hard for us to put things off in, into the future. Um, and we all carry that guilt a lot in spending. And like you were talking earlier about women being very good at 
being on the ball around personal health and personal right. hygiene, perhaps. But when it comes to finances, there just seems to be this slip. And debt, too. And debt, exactly. Um, and that's just normal behavior. We have our intentions, and then we have our behavior, and it sits sort of somewhere way out there. And um, the way that behavioral science is helping us tackle that is not necessarily to try and manipulate the way that people behave or change the way that the brain works, because it doesn't you can't work. Do that. You can't yeah. do that. You can't do that. But it does make sure that people can be armed with tools to make better decisions themselves. It also means that institutions like finance, um, you know, like the big banks or some of the FIs or even government Financial institutions. Financial institutions, mm -hmm. yes, exactly. Acronym number one. <laughs> um, are better informed so that the interactions and, and the programs and services and goods that they're building don't make us make bad decisions. So I know that when I heard you speak, I took some notes, right? Mm -hmm. And you talked about intention action gap. Yes. And then there's value action gap. Yes. What's the difference? So intention action gap is similar to what I was just talking yeah. about. You've got your intentions. Uh, you wake up in the morning. I'm not going to buy a latte today because I'm going to save for the future. We know that maybe not just avoiding lattes is what's going to be the difference between a good and bad environment or retirement, but that's, that's one thing. Um, so we know that when they wake up in the morning and say, I'm not going to have a latte, they might still do that, but that's their intention. And then their behavior is somewhere way over here. So it's a good intention. It's a good intention. But the behavior is different. Yeah, but the behavior is different. And, and the gap between that intention and behavior can be really big or really small. It's dependent on the day. It's dependent on how we feel. For women, it might be time of month. Right? There's right. different uh, contextual factors that widen or close in that gap. The same is true with our values. So we might wake up in the morning and we're a really good person. We don't lie, we don't cheat, we don't steal. But in the nuances of our daily life, the context changes and sometimes that line gets a, little, gets a little bit gray. So good people sometimes make decisions that are not great for themselves or great for others. It doesn't make them a bad person, they're just, the context has swayed them away a little bit from their, their compass. Okay, so we're gonna delve even more into this when we come back after the break to talk more about women and behavioral economics here on Finances Personal. Welcome back to Finances Personal. I'm Liz Namofsky. Today we're discussing behavioral economics with Milena Vinsky, who is a behavioral economics lead at PricewaterhouseCoopers Canada. So Milena, before we went to break, we were talking about the study and mental shortcuts, mm -hmm. uh, and it leads to predictable patterns in behavior, but there's so many of them. And I want to go through them all because they sure. all have some sort of an interesting interpretation for in each individual. Mm -hmm. Overconfidence. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because a lot of people are overconfident. They are. <laughs> and a lot of people don't think they're overconfident, but in fact they are. Mm -hmm. And just to talk a little bit about or anchor it in, in the conversation that we were just having when we were talking about the gap between people's intentions and their, their behavior, overconfidence is one of those key drivers that will widen that gap. And so um, there's a great study that it's, you know, 90% of people believe they're an above average driver, even when they've just been in the hospital after having just caused a car accident. Oh my gosh. You know? yeah. Do you think road rage is, is, is at its, its <laughs> ultimate high because of this? It's testosterone. <laughs> um, but it's interesting because when we're evaluating the likelihood of negative events happening, which is often how we plan for the future, right? We plan for the future and create a nest egg to protect ourselves in the future. Right. We're underestimating the likelihood that a negative event will happen. And so we have a tendency to have a rosy understanding of what the future will be, but that's not always going to be the case. And so when we're financially planning, it can impede our ability to plan appropriately or to understand the risks appropriately. And that's why we always tell people to have an emergency fund. Exactly. Right? Exactly. But it's hard for people to keep contributing to the emergency fund if there's other things at play. And that's where overconfidence <laughs> is an issue. So what about present bias? And that's a great example of not putting money aside to focus on something that you want to 
purchase or, or buy now. So present bias is the idea that we would rather reward ourselves with something now, even if it means that um, down the line there will be a consequence because of that. So for example, you know, overspending today on something that is maybe luxurious, maybe something we don't need, even if that means in the long run it will be a detriment to our retirement well-being. Um, and this is primarily just because the future is really, really far off and the brain just crunches a bunch of information to make the best decision for now. Um, and in the future, the data is a little bit sparse and so we just fill it with really positive things and just assume everything's gonna be okay and so it's easy for us to discount the future. But present bias is one of the reasons why most people go into debt. Yes, absolutely. It's like one of the most commonly talked about, you know, issues, shortcuts, biases with why people are running into debt issues. Okay, overload. Overload, yes. Overload is one of our favorites because it can be very transient. Um, there's ideas of informational overload and emotional overload. And so informational overload would almost be like people just reading things off of Twitter, different internet stories, news stories, <laughs> yes. blogs, whatever. Yeah, I would think about it or equate it to the idea of informational overload is like when you get an app and you download it and you have to scroll through all the legal language before you agree. Okay. That is an information overload because what's happening there is the teams or the, you know, the, the lawyers that wrote that script assumed that people would read it understand their rights and privileges, understand the risks, and accept with that knowledge in mind. But that's not the case. No we one don't. reads it. When there's information overload, we skip through it or we completely go into a paralysis. So information overload can be when we're buying a policy, when we're opening um, a new line of credit or buying a mortgage. It can be when we're choosing between um, different retirement uh, plan options, for example, when there's too many, we just can't decide. But so you know what? It's really important because you and I were talking before the show, and I was mentioning that you know when I purchased my car, I actually read yes. the document and I caught two typos. <laughs> yes. And when I you were rare, I, I know. <laughs> and so the guy was really shocked. Yes, I'm sure. And he said, "Well, nobody reads these." Yes. I said, "Well, I do." And then he had to go back and, yeah. and get it fixed. But it's very important to read what you're signing. It is, but. With all of these biases, you can think about it as a spectrum, and everybody in the world sits on that spectrum. And you are probably somebody that is just slit, like slides really far down the <laughs> overload bias, right. where it doesn't really affect you. But when we're thinking about the majority, it does. You are two standard deviations from the mean. <laughs> That's interesting. I don't know what that means, but maybe you and I should chat about that more. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and em emotional overload is just the idea that when you're anxious or stressed, or really elated and happy, it can create the same effect that you're not going to pay attention to a lot of detail. It's true. You're, you're going to breeze. You're going to breeze through things. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Okay. How about hot cold decision? Hot cold decision um, is one of my favorites because a, a great example of it is um, let's say you and your partner get into a bit of a tiff, and uh, you might be both at work and you're texting each other, or you you know just got off the call and you hang it up, and you go to write a message that is. Emotionally Speaking. inspired, okay. yes. <laughs> and uh, there's a difference between sending, like sending it right then and there versus taking a breath and waiting and coming back to it and sending it. Which is what everyone should do with emails, everything. We talk about this all the time in the workplace. Don't send something when you are in a hot state. And that's what it means when you're stressed, when you're anxious, when you're angry. You make different rash decisions, and it's almost like your rational part of your brain turns off and you become very primal. Right. So all these shortcuts and biases just explode. Um, and so what we do a lot of times when people are in states when they are making tough decisions about their financial future, we try to get them out of a hot state and move them into a cold state where they can rationally affect or um, actually evaluate their options. So what about confirmation bias? Uh, confirmation bias is our tendency to seek information that confirms our understanding of the okay. world and really undervalue information that does not. So from the time we're born, all throughout our lives, we're building a mental model of how we understand the world. And it's very comfortable when information we see confirms what we believe to be right. true. It's very uncomfortable when information makes us think that we actually have it wrong. So you've made a decision yes. and then you find other information and you think, oh my gosh, 
Yes, yeah, and it's, that's really challenging and people have a tendency to be defensive about that and we undervalue that information. So when you hear, for example, from an expert that perhaps your home investing has not been the most, the most appropriate tools and there's a better way to invest for your future, that can sometimes be a little bit challenging because your whole time you were investing, you were looking for information to confirm that what you were doing was right. And so navigating that challenge is, is hard for anybody who's on the advisor side of things. So before we go to the break, there's also choice architecture, which yes. I love. That's yes. kind of one of my favorites. Because <laughs> it sounds cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, no, it's because of the options and everything, right? Yes. It's the thought process. Yeah, when we are evaluating the value of a good, a service, a product, a person, um, that value is not inherent to that object or or. or, or um, service or good, it's dependent on all the other alternatives that are available. So when you are providing a choice to somebody, if you um, have provided some alternatives that are perhaps less valuable, then they're going to be more likely to choose the one that you have sort of amped up the, the perceived value. So yeah. we'll be right back after this break to learn more about how behavioral economics can help women take control of their finances here on Finances Personal. Welcome back to Finances Personal. I'm Liz Namofsky. Joining me today is Melania Vinsky, Behavioral Economics Lead at PricewaterhouseCoopers Canada. Melania, before we went to the break, we talked about choice architecture. And I love this because when I heard you speak, you were talking about the option between a $2 apple, a $7 apple, and a $12 apple. <laughs> So yes. explain that because to me, the choice is the $2 apple. Yes, so when I showed you those, I started off by showing you two options. Uh, the, I think it was the, the $2 apple and the $7 apple. Mm -hmm. And the obvious choice is the $2. Right. Why would you pay $7 for an apple? Right. And if it's the most organic apple, no apple is worth $7. But then I provided you a third choice and this was the $12 apple. And it was the same size as the $7 apple. And now all of a sudden when you're reviewing those three options, the best value play is actually the $7 apple. But if I'd shown you, you know, shown you those three initially, you would have chosen the $7 initially. If I start with just the two, then you have a different choice. And so dependent on the alternatives that are provided, value is perceived differently. It's true. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about, it's so hard for people to save money for the future. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a really, really hard time doing it. And you, and uh, when I heard you speak, um, a lot of institutions talk about put away $150 a month. That's all you need to do. But we all have a really hard time thinking about $150. Yes. But if you think about it as $5 a day, it totally changes your mind. It does. That's one of our favorite, uh, our favorite biases or shortcuts that we call framing. Okay. And it's this idea that our understanding of, of an action is entirely different depending on how it's framed. So the, the study that you're talking about is they had people either save $150 or $5 a day. And overwhelmingly people chose $5 a day, even though that actually is more than $150. Right. Time. Yeah. And so because it was framed differently, people evaluated it as being different because $5 a day is easy. $150 is a lot of money. So what can people do more actively to save money then? So some of our favorite tricks that we've actually seen work really, really well is this idea of we have a tendency to place different value on different kinds of money. So when money comes through um, things like a tax return, mm -hmm. we have a tendency to think of that money as free. Yeah, a lot of people think, oh my gosh, I'm going to go shopping. I'm going to go shopping or I'm going to go on that great vacation. And don't get me wrong, we deserve the vacation, we deserve the, we deserve the shopping spree. <laughs> but in reality, paying down debt is more important in the long run because you'll have more money in the long run to be able to go on those great trips or right. go on those shopping sprees. So almost creating a default for yourself where automatically that money that you get in your tax return will go towards paying down debt or will go towards a retirement plan and making sure that that default is in place so you're not even seeing that money in the first place will make it really easy. Um, the second, and this is true of any money that comes through sort of um, uh, out of your traditional sort of income that would come in every month. 
Um, the second is what we call implementation intentions. And that sounds very academic. It a does. Little, a little bit weird. Um, so we can blame the academics. <laughs> Again. Again, exactly. We love them, but they are very esoteric. Um, and this is the idea that it's very easy for us to make a goal. And when we make a goal, that's our intention. Um, but if our goal isn't specific enough, that's when we see that gap between the intention and the actual saving behavior. So in implementation intentions is just taking your goal one step further. So rather than saying, I'm going to save $150 this month, mm -hmm. you're actually going to go through your expenditures for your last couple months and say, what can I realistically remove? Right? What can I really take out? Do I need that coffee? Because every morning it's a big part of my day right. and there's a big quality of life benefit. Or is it, you know, the um, random shopping sprees that sometimes you do on your walk home? Right. Right. And those ones are a little bit easier to get rid of because right. you can control for those. And so it's actually going through and deciding that I have a tendency on Thursdays to go shopping on my way home. On the end of Thursdays, I'm going to go to the gym instead or I'm gonna go meet up with a friend or go home instead. Right. And actually making that concrete plan that is the root cause of the action in the first place makes you significantly more likely to follow through. Well, I read one of your, one of your papers and you talked about the fact that in order to make the commitment, mm -hmm. you actually write down your goals, yes. you sign it. Yes. And then you give it to a friend or a family member mm -hmm. so that you're held accountable. Yes, we talk, talk about those as commitment devices. And some people do this through sharing on social media, people who are a little bit maybe more extroverted. Okay. Sometimes it works when you have a little collection of girlfriends that are all trying to save for a similar cause or a similar reason for, you know, whether it's retirement or whether it's the fact that you're gonna treat yourselves in five years to, you know, the, the dream trip. Um, having other people that you are accountable to makes your reputation on the line. And if there's one thing that will drive behavior, it is, is your reputation. Exactly. <laughs> Especially amongst girlfriends. <laughs> well, the, the same thing is, you know, if you talk to somebody, do you go to the gym? Yeah, I go, but you actually don't go. Right. But if you like, if you're like me, I schedule it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Saturday, yes. and it's in my schedule and it's in my calendar and I go. Yes. And As it is in your calendar and you don't have an excuse to fill that gap with something else. Which is important. It's very important. And we also find that one of the big reasons is people will say, oh, next week I'll be better. Next week I'll Everyone does next, next week. week. <laughs> but all the research shows that the behavior then doesn't change. No. And the only way that the behavior will change is if you specifically state what you're going to do differently next week. You have to take it down that one deeper level of analysis in order to really change your behavior. Otherwise, the whims of the day will just sort of drive you in your normal habits. Okay, well, speaking of behavior, let's talk about the ostrich effect. <laughs> That's one of my favorite stories because ostriches are not cute, they're funny looking. Yeah. Animals. But it's this idea that we have a tendency to put our head in the sand um, when we are a basically approaching things that are a little bit uncomfortable. One of the most common being when we get a bill. Right. So when we get a bill at the end of the month, sometimes it's easier to just put it in the bill stack, which is out of sight. Maybe you put it in a drawer and shut it. But it doesn't go away. Up. It doesn't go away. And that's one of the biggest issues. We have a tendency, because we're overconfident, to think that everything's going to be okay, even though that bill is put away, um, and we avoid it. And that's actually one of the biggest issues that escalates debt. So you might not have a strong ostrich effect in the beginning, but as your debt grows, it becomes more and more strong in, in predicting the fact that you're not you're not going to pay off those bills. So last question, how do people make better decisions? What do we do? Um, I think honestly, the biggest issue um, that will at least get people there is, is to make a plan. So just like you would maybe plan out lunches for your kids for a week, or maybe you would plan, you know, um, different activities with your friends for a week, try and sit down and do the same thing for how you're going to spend your money. Right, And I think the second thing is, and this is especially true for women because I think generally we are quite intuitive about our own behavior, is when you are in a hot state, when you are anxious, or when you're tired at the end of the day, take yourself home. <laughs> Don't make any big decisions because those are the ones that are going to be really, really challenging down the road. Great words of wisdom. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks to Behavioral Economics Insights, financial sectors can design programs and products to strengthen the financial literacy of women and empower them to be confident decision makers. 
This relatively new field combines insights from psychology, judgment, decision making, and economics to generate a more accurate understanding of human behavior. And it's this understanding of human behavior that will help organizations implement opportunities to create smarter, more targeted, and effective financial literacy programs for all. I'd like to thank Milenia Vinsky for joining me today and you, our viewers, for watching. For more information about our show and to view past episodes, go to financespersonal.ca. I'm Liz Namofsky. Bye for now.